It's time! The DDP, that's the Devlin Dool podcast. Simon Dool out of the Caribbean still at the moment. Welcome to the show again, Dooley. Thank you very much, Marty. Yeah, pop down to Guyana now. So we're sort of, uh, it's still part of the Caribbean, yet it's not an island. We're at the top of the uh, mainland of uh, South America. So here for the final week and a half of, of the CPL. Yeah, you get a geography lesson while you're doing this. How many different places have you been? You've been Barbados, you've been Jamaica. What else? Uh, Trinidad, St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, and now Guyana. So yeah, yeah, we're getting around, mate. But it's all, it's a, uh, it's a great spot. Look, it, it's, um, obviously the Caribbean is vastly different from country to country, um, and from region to region, but, um, yeah, Guyana have just had a, a huge, um, discovery in the last couple of years of, uh, of oil. So it is a place on the rise and, um, population wise, massive and growing. And obviously, um, they're starting to to produce and, and drill for oil and, and um, it's going to be a very, very, I think, a profitable place in the next five to ten years. There you go, people. That's where you're putting your share money at the moment, oil in Guyana. The other thing, though, Dooley, is that, you know, just listening to you, you know, list off those names, you know, we, we grew up, you and me and our generation, um, knowing this West Indian side and we always had this idea, didn't they, that there was just this kind of group of islands like maybe Fiji or Samoa or somewhere like that and all of these people kind of loved each other and they're all of the same tribe and all of that. But an actual fact when you say it like that you're talking about completely different countries the fact they got together at all and agreed and played together is probably quite remarkable well, well it's taken i think when you look back at the history of west indies cricket it has taken certain people to gel that country those countries together to make a great cricket team it took clive lord yep. uh back in back in the late 70s and and uh, sorry uh, yeah 70s and, and late 70s vivian richards obviously um lara kind of got them back into it um, through a period of time when he had Walsh and Ambrose and, and those sorts of guys, Richie Richardson. But it, it's sort of, it, it's been a bit few and far between in the last probably 15 years. Darren Sammy was able to do it from, um, obviously Darren's a, a St. Lucia native, but you are talking and, and it's it's really weird. It's, I mean, I know people say, what about a Moana Pacifica team? But if you try and get a sort of Moana Pacifica team and, and, and throw another couple in there as well, and then you've got all of those different countries fighting for who wants to be president of the Moana Pacifica um, you know, sort of conglomerate. It's a very difficult situation. And I don't think we quite have ever understood how tough it is to bring all these countries together to make a cricket team that, that gets on. Because the selectors, you know, they get, they get barreled for selecting people from their country and, and barreled for not selecting people from Guyana. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy situation. So... It has, it, you know, learning more about it over the years, it surprised me that they were able to get together and be such a magnificent cricket team at different times. Speaking of magnificent and cricket teams in the same sentence, our T20 squad was announced uh, last week for, or Tuesday it actually was announced, in fact, for the T20 World Cup in Aussie uh, next month. What do you think of that side? There's been grumblings here, of course, that the same old names keep coming out. And Shane Jurgensen was on the program with Lachlan. Lachlan asked him about, you know, we're making the same mistakes, selection mistakes. We, you know, we we seem to be stuck in the same rut. And he he quotes the same lines that New Zealand cricket keep rolling out about. Oh, we're learning this. We're getting lessons in, but we don't seem to be. That's the thing. I mean, it's, it's easy to say these things, but by looking at that squad, have we learned anything at all from the Chapel Hadley? Have we learned anything at all from anything over the last year? Oh, it, it's, a, it's a different beast of World Cup and, and we always seem to front up and, and you know certain players seem to stand up at, at the right times a la Daryl Mitchell in that game against England um, in, in Abu Dhabi you know Kane Williamson was brilliant against Australia w- although we couldn't get across the line uh, my, my, I guess my only concerns are probably around not having a absolute specialist wicketkeeper um, having to use Devin Conway because they want to fit um, fit players into that side um, a huge amount of all-rounders, which will probably all play. I think, you know, I, I can see us sort of having uh, Mitchell and, and um, Nisham and Satner and Bracewell almost all playing um, if we sort of go down that route. And they might bat six, five, six, seven, eight, or six, seven, eight, nine even. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting combination. Uh, they've, got to, they've got to get uh, Martin Guptill sort of either in or out. He's, he's either going to play or he's not going to play. Finn Allen will will open with um, Conway if Guptill doesn't play. And then Williamson and, and probably Glenn Phillips along those lines is, is how they're going to look at it. And then when you look at the bowling, I, I think a bowling attack is, is good enough. And I think they're selecting the right players. Uh, look, if we could go in with um, Trent Bolt and Lockie Ferguson, 
um, and Mitchell Santner. Uh, look, whether whether who, whether we play a third seamer or whether we just use those all rounders, whether each side he plays as a as a sort of a toss up. But I don't think there are other players in New Zealand at the moment that are forcing their way into the side. This is possibly, you know, the, the, thing, the thing about having back to back World Cups. And I say back to back; they've only been one year apart. So you probably are going to take a nucleus, if not all, of exactly the same players to that World Cup, having made a final and, and, and had a very good tournament. I, don't, I, I didn't actually foresee many changes at all, and they haven't made many changes, and I'm not surprised by it. Uh, having said that, though, I mean, our only reference point of late has been the Chapel Hadley, and, and that team just yeah. so seriously underperformed in that. And they, you know, they just looked as though they were... To me, I mean, this is only looking from the outside, but laughing and joking on the sideline when you're six for 30 in the middle of a series, which is meant to mean something to you. It just looked to me that there's too many players that are cosy and comfortable in that side. And Simon, how the hell do you break into that when we're not playing any cricket? There hasn't been any domestic cricket here since the beginning of the year. Yeah, that, that's a tough thing as well. How, how do you break into it? Um, how does someone get into that side when, you, when they're not playing a lot? And the Chapel Hadley, I mean, when it first came about, I mean, how good was it? We, we were always, you know, we were up, excited for it. But I, what I've found, though, in the last sort of four or five years, it's been pushed aside, obviously COVID. Uh, it's been jammed into places where it probably shouldn't be, where one team's either been playing and the other team hasn't been playing. Um, it, it's a, it, it should be the pinnacle of our summer. Should be. And, and if we can't make it the pinnacle of our summer, you know, at least once every two years, then I think there's something wrong. It should be one of those situations, Marty, where... You know, 15,000, 20,000 Kiwis want to go to Sydney, Melbourne over the course of five days and watch three games. Yeah. And, and, and that's how it should be. And Aussies should want to come to Auckland and, and do Auckland Hamilton or, or, and, or Auckland Christchurch or whatever it might be and, and watch those games. But it, it seems to have, after a great fanfare and all that to, to kick it off years ago, it, it just it, it seems to have sort of been thrown in as a, not an afterthought, but just... Sadly, as something that let's try and fit it in somewhere. Yeah, I agree. Rather than making it a, a real priority, so that that's um, that's tough. Look, I don't ever like seeing players laughing and joking, you know, when they've been outdone. But when did we last go to Australia and really compete? I can't remember. Um, well, eighty five, eighty seven. No, actually, tell you what, it was Hobart, the Hobart Test, mate. Let's be honest. I actually, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, they're so few and far between, and, and our chances to that, play them, a, yeah. That, that's it, and I, I, and I think when we've when we've gone to Australia, we, yeah, you know, when we went for that test series a few years, Oof. three years ago, um, we completely stuffed up the selection policy. Lockie Ferguson should have played one of the test matches against England. Remember when we um, when we played out that 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 game at uh, Mount Monganui, and Ferguson should have played at least one of those test matches against England. Didn't play. We took him to Perth, unleashed him. Thought we were unleashing some great superstar test match cricket. He hardly he'd hardly bowled in four day cricket, and he hadn't played a test up until that point. Broke down. And then Tim Southey and um, uh, the other bowlers had to bowl a million overs That's in that right. first heat, and it cooked them for the rest of the series. Yeah. And we had no warm-up matches because we didn't need a warm-up match, remember? We just went no. to the, Yeah. No, no. All right. Simon Dawless was the DDP. A whole lot of new legislative changes from the ICC. I'm going to run a couple by you here. The ManCAD is now legit. Dooley, I like this, mate, and I like it because, you know, I love a lot of baseball. I know you love your baseball as well. Listen, you can you can encroach off the bag. That's fine. However, the pitcher at any stage can turn around, throw that ball, and you can get out, and then the coach is going to smack your butt because of it. If you are encroaching in cricket, effectively what you're doing is bending the rules. You're cheating. You're trying to get an advantage. Why the hell should you be allowed to get away with that? I'm on the bowler's side here, mate. Take the bails off. Go back to the pavilion, son. 100% with you, Marty. Look, this is no longer, and it shouldn't be called a man cad. It should be called a run out of the bowl. There you go. Or a brown. Yeah. Or a brown. The br brown was the bloke who um, who did it. Um, so, look, or uh, well, the guy that was run out, sorry, it was it was Vinu Mancad who, uh, who took the bails off. But Brown was the guy who was cheating at the time. So I'm with you. If I bowl, a, if I if I overstep the bowling crease by one or two centimetres, I'm, I'm, I'm done. It's a no ball. No ball. A free hit. That's it. Yet a batter can be a yard out of his crease cribbing and, and and cheating and, and and nothing happens so i'm totally with you and and i'm totally with this change of um law um and yeah looking forward to sort of a, a few more batters just sort of stay increased bound a little bit well it's about runs i mean this the white ball cricket is about runs and that's you know part of the yeah. other 
uh, law change and that what they want to do now is integrate artificial grass with grass for the men's white ball. They've been doing this with the women's. I know that you know that. And, and to me, that is just a yep. signal that says what we want is we want flat pitches where you can hit a, a mountain of runs that haven't got a lot of variation at all. And the bowler's going to get even less out of them. Now, it's hard enough for a bowler, and I'm on your side again, to bowl in white ball cricket as it is. But if you're going to make the pitches as flat as that, I mean, what's the signal? I mean, do we do we need 500 runs to be hit in one day? Do we need 250, 300 in T20s? <laughs> I like the bowling. Mate, I mean, bowling is as much to me as pitching in baseball. You get a great duel going on. Not every game has to be exactly the same. No, it doesn't. I, I do like a hybrid pitch. They've used them in English uh, county cricket for some time now. They've used them with success. Uh, they are getting better and better. And all it does is it just knits a little bit of the normal grass with the hybrid, with the artificial um, grass. They do actually give. What, what it does do, it does give a bit of, bit of pace. And if you've got a hard pitch, what that artificial grass does is it allows the ball to, to kiss off it a little bit better. So it doesn't take as much pace off it. And they're actually better pitches. And, and at times, they're almost as good to bowl on as a full grass pitch. So it's not like the, just saying, look, it's going to be flatter. What they are saying is it just gives the grass a little bit more time to intertwine with the artificial um, nature of the, the nylon-y type um, structure that they use. And what it, and it just adds pace. It gives the, gives the surface a bit of pace. So the quick bowlers won't mind it. Okay. I, I won't say it's going to be all in the batter's favour. Some of them might be but I think there will be enough in it for the bowlers still if they get them right. I mean, they've got different types. They've got 80-20 as in, you know, 80% grass, 20% hybrid. They've got, a, you know, got 70-30s. They, they, they vary them, and they're trying to figure out exactly which ones are the best. So the technology in and around them is good. I don't think it's all about just being flat, flat, flat for batters. The DDP podcast is on at the moment. You listen to Simon Dolus in the Caribbean doing the CPL, and you'll be off doing the T20 World Cup next month in October. The other one is to speed the game up. So batsmen now, you don't get three minutes, you get two minutes to get to your crease. And also if the if the batsmen cross over during a, a catch, well, whoever comes in faces that first ball. I guess what they're trying to do, again, is speed it up. Like somebody was telling me yesterday that the first games of T20 cricket took about an hour and a half. You're now getting into three and a half hours and all the fanning around in the field and all of that kind of stuff. Again, what do they want? Do they want it two, two and a half hours? Because that's all the young people can concentrate for anyway. They're on their cell phones every five <laughs> minutes, aren't they? So, but I mean, seriously, though, mate, you, you, you don't want a T20 going for half of a one day. No, you don't. No, look, I mean, it, it is about pace of the game, and I, I like it. A T20 was, was first, when it first came around, it was about three hours and 20 minutes, three and a half hours max, So, which is which is fine. I mean, we, we had one this morning. It was all over. started at 10 o'clock. It was all over and done with at 2.20. So it was brilliant. Um, uh, sorry, 1.20. Um, so three hours and 20 minutes, it was it was fantastic. That's kind of what they want. The batting one um, that the new man's on strike, no matter what, I absolutely love because that rewards the bowler. So if you, you think about you've got, um, let's say for old time's sake, you've got Owen Morgan or, or Joss Butler batting at one end, but England are seven down chasing and you pick up a wicket. Ado Rashid comes in, but they've crossed while the ball's in the air, yet Butler goes back on strike. So what happens is that Ado Rashid gets out all of a sudden, Chris Jordan or Joffre Archer has to face the next ball, and it's guaranteed. So I love that one. That's in favour of the bowlers. It's rewarding the bowler for getting a wicket. So what you find now, when teams are seven, eight down, if the tail end of slogs one up in the air, they can't just cross and get the batter back on strike. So they have to think a little bit more about it. So I love that one. That's fantastic. And it's all about, it is about the pace of the game. To me, um, the, the batter's crossing in the middle, making sure they've got you know only two minutes or two and a half minutes in a test match. Uh, I, I applaud that one as well. They've, they've got to make sure that the game is continually sped up or, or, or continually going at a decent pace.